Today, on the very first day of Black History Month, this is the headline that I woke up to. More than a dozen historically black colleges and universities were the target of bomb threats. Howard University was the first to issue a shelter-in-place order for its students early this morning, and several more schools soon followed suit. The FBI said it was aware of the threats and are working with local law enforcement to address them. And if this story feels at all familiar to you, it's because it is. Just yesterday, Howard University and at least five other historically black colleges received threats. And less than a month ago, at least eight HBCUs received similar threats. And while they were found to be unsubstantiated, that doesn't actually make them any less concerning, if not outright terrifying for the students and faculty who attend and work at those schools. One Texas State University student told NBC News that they believed the threats were no coincidence and likely racially motivated, saying, quote, it just kind of goes to show you that regardless of some progress that we're seeing, racism is still alive and present. And let's consider where we are currently standing in this moment as a country. We're in the middle of a spike of both extremism and domestic terrorism. Don't take my word for it. Here's what the head of the FBI had to say about it just last year. We've increased the number of domestic terrorism investigations from around 1,000 or so when I got here to up to about 1,400 at the end of last year to about 2,000 now. That's domestic terrorism overall. When it comes to racially motivated violent extremism, that number, again, number of investigations and number of arrests has grown significantly on my watch. Uh, and the number of arrests, for example, of racially motivated violent extremists who are what you would categorize as white supremacists last year was almost triple the number it was in my first year as director. Now look, we don't yet know if these bomb threats are connected to any hate groups or extremist groups, but what we do know is that they were made to a specific type of school. We do know a decision was made to call them today, February the 1st, on the very first day of Black History Month. And the injection of fear and chaos into something as mundane as going to school harkens back to some of the ugliest times in our nation's history. Like in 1957, when a group of teenagers ages 15 to 17, dubbed the Little Rock Nine, were assaulted by white mobs on their way to school. Or in 1960, when Ruby Bridges, at the tender age of six years old, had to be escorted to school by federal agents because of the vitriol that she faced from a hostile crowd of mostly white students and parents. This is Ruby Bridges now, 67 years young and a civil rights legend in her own right. And you know what? She's a living reminder that we're not as far removed from that American history as people seem to think. And joining me now for a panel discussion to start us off on this very first night of Black History Month, civil rights activist Ray McKenson. He's the co-founder of Campaign Zero. Brittany Cooper is an associate professor of Africana and Women and Gender Studies at Rutgers University. Also with us is Jackie Reed, an Emmy-winning co-host of New York Live. I'm so incredibly thrilled to have all of you here for this conversation. Dory, I'll start with you. Threats against black institutions are not new. We live in America. So what's your reaction, given that history, to this round of threats against HBCUs? And are you at all concerned that this could result in real tangible violence. Yeah, it reminds me that so much of the work of white supremacy is actually to make black people too afraid to live, too afraid to learn, too afraid to be in community with each other. And that's what these attacks on HBCUs are, the threats. But it reminds me too about the larger work around the police, right? That like the terror of police violence hasn't stopped either. That part of our work is to shine a light on these things and to push back and never be too afraid to live the lives that we know we deserve and the lives that we already live rooted in joy. Oh, I love I love the idea of of thinking about joy on a night like tonight as well. And Brittany, I, I feel like, you know, some of this history needs to be laid out uh, for folks in the audience who maybe they, this is just not their jam. This is not their ministry there. We obviously are seeing the attacks on the state level and local level. 
uh, around critical race theory and teaching American history, but this is why we need to teach it. So lay out for us um, some of this history. Ruby Bridges is alive and well, and she is seeing headlines um, that we could probably pull straight out of the 1960s. Do you think today's threats are part of a larger problem? And do you see a connection to the the fight and, and the, the movement to ban critical race theory in schools on the local level? So one of the things that I think is being gestured toward is that we have uh, the first black woman vice president uh, who's a graduate of an HBCU. Uh, the battle is on in Georgia because Stacey Abrams, who's a who's a graduate of Spelman, uh, is running for governor. And so part of what this larger attack on higher education is about is curtailing the access of people of color and working class people into the echelons of power. So that narrative is 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 propagated on the local level, but it 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 rises all the way to the level that I teach at, at the college and university level. And so part of what folks are literally saying is that black colleges have become an amazing pathway to leadership um, so that Georgia flips blue and helps Biden into the presidency and then also delivers a black woman to the presidency. And white supremacy cannot abide that. So it is symbolically attacking these institutions because they are seen as an actual threat to a, a democracy or to a form of leadership in which uh, these folks want only white men and white folks who are conservative to, you know, to dominate those positions. So, yes, it's in this long history, both of excluding uh, black folks' access to education which is a legacy of enslavement, uh, and then of violently suppressing their right to go to schools, even after the law has done so. And then to DeRay's point, at the point that you can't do it via threat of actual violence and you can't do it using the law, then you simply create a context of terror in which people feel unsafe. Uh, and let me add that we have to remember that university students are also going to school under the threat of COVID, right? Uh, that college campuses are really struggling to help students to survive and in the midst of this pandemic. And so when we have conversations in the university about white privilege with our students, one of the things we need to be saying is that just like all of us are stressed about what it means to have to be on campuses with each other and to stay safe, now in this moment, you have folks in our country who are making it even harder if you're a black student at a black college to go to school in the midst of a pandemic simply because of your skin color. That is what we mean when we're talking about white privilege and white supremacy. And Jackie, to the point that Brittany just made about HBCUs being seen as a place where future leaders are cultivated and trained up and raised up, uh, you know, citing the vice president, Kamala Harris, you know, when these hate crimes increase, there's evidence that shows that more people enroll in HBCUs. So speak to how going to an HBCU can provide that foundation uh, for the leaders of the future that, you know, there are folks out here that are very afraid of that. Yeah, I mean, I went to an HBCU. I attended Clark Atlanta University, and I started off my college career at the University of Georgia. And I just was not seen. I did not thrive. But when I transferred to Clark Atlanta University, that is where I thrived. That's where I had an opportunity to be the managing editor of the newspaper, to host my own television show, to do so many different things. But the reason why so many, there's so many reasons why ch students choose to go to HBCUs, but one of those main reasons is it is a safe space. It is a safe space for you to express yourself and to live your life and to figure out life as a black student. It angers me that this is happening, particularly on the first day of Black History Month. You know, to Brittany's point, you know, these students are already, you know, going to school virtually, a lot of them because of COVID, right? So they're not getting that campus experience. Then on top of that, they are dealing, living in a world where the realities of racism already exist. We learned that so well well from Ahmaud Aubrey, these kids can't even go jogging, you know what I mean, or just live their lives and experience life without possibly being harmed or murdered. It's, it, it is a, a scary, scary time for these students. And then add to that the mental health uh, issues that a lot of students are dealing with on top of everything else. It is a difficult time for these students, and now they have to deal with bomb threats for the ones that are on campus. It just makes me angry that this is happening. 
You know, to Brittany, I want to bring it back to you on the point that Jackie just made about safe spaces, because as a college professor, there's all that uh, conservative backlash against, um, you know, folks trying to be, quote unquote, too woke and create spaces where people feel safer to have uh, real and authentic conversation. So speak to the idea that at this moment, books are being banned, critical race theory is being banned via legislation on the local level to protect the feelings of white students because parents fear that they will be harmed by those conversations at the expense of the black and brown students who experience the racism and also need to learn that history. Everybody does. Absolutely. So let me say, too, that I'm a proud alumna of Howard University. I never miss an opportunity to share that. Um, and one of the things that Howard did for me and that I think Black colleges do, um, that was the first time in my life where I wasn't in a predominantly white environment and where I wasn't always having to prove that I was as good as white students. And so I got the opportunity to then think about who I was as Brittany Cooper and who I wanted to be in the world. And so it healed a lot of the anti-blackness that I had imbibed from being in white environments. But I think that black students can thrive in any institution. We don't just have to go to black colleges. But the problem is that we ask the wrong questions. So when we talk about diversity in white institutions, it becomes a conversation about how white kids can have a diverse experience. And the view is also that black colleges aren't diverse, but they have black people from all over the world in them. So they're often more diverse sometimes than very homogenous white environments. But the thing that I would say to white folks who are very bothered by this notion of safe spaces is stop being mad that people of color are seeking safety and start asking what it is about these institutions that are unsafe. What is it about the institutional project of whiteness that leads to violence, that leads to a sense of entitlement, and that makes our students feel like they have to gravitate towards one another in order to feel safety. Black students don't have to defend their right to safe spaces. White folks and white institutions and people in power have to defend why they keep building spaces that are fundamentally unsafe for us to inhabit. And DeRay, you know, so many of the headlines going back to the summer of 2020 about the so-called racial reckoning in this country. Um, you know, there's been a lot of ink spilt over what it all meant, what was achieved. As we look back at those protests and that movement that, I mean, let's be clear, this is all connected to the history, um, you know, going back to the civil rights movement and even before that. We know that to be true um, as students of that history. But speak to what was tangibly achieved in this particular phase and um, you know, how how this particular phase was multiracial protests in a way that we really had not seen um, up into the summer of 2020. Yeah, you know, some of it is people just understood better. I remember when we were in the street in Ferguson in 2014, we were convincing people that this was a problem. By 2020, people were like, okay, I get it. They were like, I get it. Something has to be done. And that's actually really important. And I also think that, you know, people didn't realize some key facts, that the police actually kill more people in suburban communities than almost all other communities combined. It's actually not cities, for instance. Uh, but there were a lot of really good tangible wins. So we think about no-knocks. There are six states that restricted the use of no-knocks at the state level. The first First ever restrictions in U.S. history. 19 states at the state level restricted police officer use of force, which is big. One state, the state of Maryland, uh, repealed the Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights. And that's a big deal because not only was it the first repeal, but Maryland is actually the first state in the country that had a Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights. And we've seen other things happen. We've seen states think about traffic enforcement and moving police officers away from that. We've seen alternatives to the police not be sort of a random idea that people think about but actually like a real idea. And we've also seen people talk about the relationship between harm reduction and abolition, that part of our work is to make sure that people are here today, that we protect people, we make sure that they are not harmed by systems today, while we also work to undo the terror of the system at the macro level. So I'm not choosing between the end of solitary confinement and the end of incarceration. I'm actually doing both of those things at the same time. And I actually think there's a public language for that in a way that there was not before the summer 2020. So I'm excited, I'm hopeful. I do worry that people are like a little nihilistic, but like real work and real change is happening. Yeah, and Zerlina, I just well, wanted I, to add something. I love. Oh yeah, ju jump in. We have a. We have yeah. just one more minute, so please jump in. 
I just wanted to add something, too, about HBCUs being seen more of a threat. Not only do we have a woman, you know, who's a vice president who attended an HBCU, so right now it's more on the map than ever before, but also, also in the world of athletics, right? We're seeing top-tier high school athletes make the choice to go to HBCUs. You know, we see a Deion Sanders coaching at an HBCU and bring a lot of positive attention to the athletic programs there. That is seen as a threat uh, to a lot of people out there, you know, uh, across this country who love sports. And, and that is a major factor. Now these schools are on the map, and that's why I think they're being targeted in this way by racists across this country. Absolutely. Brittany Cooper, Doreen McKesson, and Jackie Reed, perfect panel to start us off on this first night of Black History Month. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Please stay safe. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.